All praise is due to Allah, we praise Him, we beseech Him and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our own selves. Whomsoever Allah guides, then none can misguide him. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides, then none can guide that person aright. I bear witness and I publicly testify that none has the right to be worshipped in truth but Allah, and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his slave and his messenger to proceed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is the third in our series of lessons on the book 40 Ahadith, the 40 Hadith of Al Imam Al Nawi Rahimullah Ta'ala. And we have reached, Alhamdulillah, Al Hadith Al Sabi', the seventh Hadith. Before we look at it concisely, we ask our brother Abdul Jalil Hafidahullah to read the English and I will try my best to read the Arabic. Wabila Tawfiq. Bismillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, and the back. The seventh hadith, on the authority of Abu Rataya Tatamid ibn Aus al-Dari, radiyallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the religion is sincerity and advice. We said to whom? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, sincerity to Allah, to his books, to his messenger, and advice to the leaders of the believers and the common people, reported by Muslim. Jazakum wa khair. عن أبي رقية تميم ابن أوس الداري رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الدين النسيحة قلنا لمن قال لله ولكتابه ولرسول وللأئمة المسلمين وعامتهم رواه مسلم this hadith, brothers and sisters, in respect to its sources, is a hadith that has been narrated by Imam Muslim, rahimullah, and the ulama have said this is from those hadith which Imam Muslim reports. As for the biography of the narrator, Abu, Abu Ruqayya Tamim al-Dari, rahimullah, then he is Tamim ibn Aws ibn Kharijah, Ad-Dari and he's known by his kunya Abu Ruqayya due to his daughter whom, whom he called Ruqayya and according to the biographers that it is not known of him having any other child besides her he was born in Philistine may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect him and return him back to the believers and he was known to be a monk, that is, a rahib, somebody who is a monk, abstains away from the dunya, lives in the monastery. Then he came to Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as part of a group of people who came to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to declare the Islam. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reports on him the hadith of Ajasasa. Ajasasa, the spy, is the hadith that could be that was been narrated by Imam Abi Dawood, where Tamim al Dari he relates that they were traveling in a boat and they got lost, and they came across a place, and in this place there was a, a some some beast or animal or human that had so much hair on its body you couldn't tell the front from its back. When they asked this thing, who are you? He said, I am a jasasa. Then the next part of the hadith, they went on to see the Dajjal who was chained. It was a very, very famous hadith. So he's the narrator of this. And he became Muslim in the ninth year 
after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he uh, fought in many of the battles of Islam and he used to live in Al Madinah we ask Allah to protect it and to raise it and to make us from its occupants then he left Medina to Sham known in English as the Levant usually informally Syria and this it also includes Jordan and Palestine after the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhu as you know Uthman radiallahu anhu was killed by the Khawarij they held siege to his house then after a while they entered into his house and they stabbed him and they killed him so after this took place, the killing of Uthman, he left and he moved to Sham. And he, may Allah be pleased with him, was somebody who was known to have taqwa and of worship. And the Imams of Hadith, such as Imam Muslim, Abi Dawood, and Tirmidhi, and Nisal ibn Majah, and Ahmed, they narrate from him Hadith. And he died in the year, the fourth year of the Hijra of the Prophet. No, the 40th year after the hijrah of the Prophet In this hadith, there are a number of expressions that we need to look at. First of all, nasiha may be translated as sincere advice. From the heart to whom you advise somebody in respect particularly of the religion. Wanting good for that person. When we say, an nasiha lillah, that nasiha is to Allah this means that the person gives sincere advice to others to establish the religion to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to stay away from all those things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited and has told us to stay away and to affirm what well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed either in his Quran or in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking his aid and his assistance when we say an nasiha to lil kitabihi to his book it means to have iman complete faith that the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah And that which is revealed in it is the truth. And we take and we believe in its rules, holding these rules and these judgments to be just. And as a side point, this is very important today. Because you have many people who interpret the Quran as they see fit. But we affirm everything in the Quran, we see its rules to be just. Just and its stories that are relayed upon of those people who came before us to be truthful and to be beneficial now somebody may say to me as a side point why is that important for example Yunus and the whale is it real or metaphorical did it really happen or is it just alluded to something else waiting for you brothers it's real isn't it yes You'll have people today say, nah, how can a human being go in a whale? Huh? Ah, it's the dangers of intellect, am I right? Dangers. And these people say, it's just metaphorical. It's not to, to be taken on face value, has a different meaning. But do they stop the viewness in the whale? Nah. Almost everything in the Quran then becomes up for grabs. So we affirm further stories out in the Quran to be beneficial and to be real. And we hold it is obligatory that we judge in accordance with the Quran in our personal affairs and other than that to happen in a kitabullah very very important especially today where the Muslims there's an ibtila of the Muslims and tahawud where people have become lackadaisical in respect to judging according to the book and the sunnah When we say an nasiha to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, some sincere advice to the Prophet, it means to have iman in him, to believe in him, 
that he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent to all of the creation and to love him and to follow him and to affirm everything that he has brought and to comply with what he has commanded and to stay away from that which he has prohibited and to defend him and his religion and a side point here it doesn't necessarily mean to take up arms but when people are defaming the Prophet وسلم, to speak the truth about the Prophet to tell the people about the seerah, to tell the people about the Prophet. When people are ignorant about the Prophet, to enlighten them about the Prophet. So we defend him and to defend his religion. When we say nasiha to the leaders of the Muslims, it means to give them advice and clarifying the truth to them. According to the Sunnah, and a side point here, why do I say according to the Sunnah? Because some people believe the way to give advice is to sit on the member or stand on the member, say, oh, so and so, itakillah, on the member. Or on the internet saying, so and so, fear Allah. But this is not the way of giving the siha to the leaders of the Muslims. We have learned from the Sunnah the way to give the siha to the Muslim is face to face. And the Prophet told us to take his hand and to advise him accordingly. Or other means, such as writing to the ruler. Not standing on the member as some people do, say to fear Allah. No. This just causes confusion. As we see in the Muslim Ummah today, you're on the internet, there is almost no Muslims. Because this one's making takfir of these people, these people are kuffar, that one's kuffar, and this king is kuffar, this president's kuffar, kuffar, kuffar. Takfir has spread. The evil of takfir has spread. Such that people don't know what are the conditions of declaring somebody to be an apostate. They don't know. So, to, to, to give them advice according to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And not to cause trouble with your advice. As I've alluded to, going to the member in the newspapers, in the sittings. I remember some years ago you would sit with a group of brothers and all they talk about is politics. Talking about this one did this and this one did that, and this one. This is causes trouble. Also, in advice to the, the, the Muslim leader is to be patient with what you see coming from them. To be patient with what you see coming from them. Whether it be personal affliction or affliction in the society, be patient. and to maintain their rights. If we look today in the Muslim countries that have some of the most severest of fitna, this issue is one of the most prime, prime issues. That they have over, tried to overthrow the ruler, the ruler fought back, and what, what do we have in civil war? Or they overthrew the ruler, got rid of the ruler, and what do they have? The country spread into different principalities, or different governances, or different groups over, or with different parts, and it's just fratricidal warfare. We have to yet to see a single Muslim country where they overthrow the ruler, not meet, or should I say, not meeting the conditions, overthrow the ruler to find they're in a better state than before it. Such that we have people today who are in certain Muslim countries Cry if only so and so was here today. That ruler which everybody gang together to overthrow, they're saying now with tears in their eyes, if only so and so was here today. Not out of love for that person, but the reality that when there is no safety, human life has no sanctity. And I remember many, many years ago in my Jahiliya as a side point. I saw a film about Gandhi. You know, all of you know Gandhi. And in it, they were going to blow up a bridge. They were going to blow up, in India, they were going to blow up a bridge. These were Hindu nationalists. 
they're going to blow up a bridge so that it would the, the bridge will fall down on the people in the train amongst them Gandhi sorry fall down on the people in the train sorry as an act of terror to shake up the British and so the one guy goes to the guy look if you blow up this bridge and it drops on the train our people Indians will be killed isn't it? Our people will be killed in that train. Maybe hundreds, thousands of people will be killed. The other man he turned to him, looked him stone cold in the eye and he said, sometimes you have to crack eggs to make an omelette. Look at that. Sometimes you have to crack eggs to make an omelette. And I told you last week how some of them behave. If it's your mum or dad, they say, hey, listen, Achi, don't worry, your mum's in Jannah. As if they went there and they saw. Your mom's in Jannah as if they saw. Even one of these takfiris, he had a dream that Allah came to him and said to him, what you're doing is a haq. <laughs> yeah, bro. Brothers and sisters, it's deep. It's so deep. So the haq of the, of the, of the ruler maintains peace in the country. And many of us here, we know what it's like to come from a country with no peace. We know what it's like when you go down the road with money in your pocket, somebody bop you on the head, take your money away. We know what it's like to be in a country where those with guns have the authority. They can do anything to you and your family with no repercussions. That's why it's important to maintain the, the hukuk of them. Also, to aid and assist the, the ruler in that which is obligatory to aid and assist them with. To aid and assist the ruler in that which is obligatory to aid and assist them with. So you don't sabotage them like some of these jama'at do, like the Ikhwan al-Muslimin do. With King Farooq, they place the face of them being loyal to King Farooq. While behind King Farooq, they were fermenting his overthrow. Until today. And so, when we say advice to the generality of the Muslims, the Ahmad al Muslimi, it is giving sincere advice to all of the Muslims, like ourselves with the Amr to Muslimin, particularly with calling them to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us today, we are busy with everything but calling people to Allah. We are so busy uh, attacking other Muslims that the real enemies of Islam, we are sleeping on them. Those people who are trying their best to change Islam, we forget who cares about them. You never hear a word from some people's lips. Certain brothers on the YouTube, night and day, this one, this, this one, that. But Big Shiatin, who all of us know, zip. It is no surprise. So the f thing is, when we say giving the Siha advice to the Amrita Muslimi, it is that give them a sincere advice and, and calling them to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And enjoying the good and forbidding the evil according to its conditions. I must say that. Enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Because if you see some of our brothers in Hyde Park Corner, Allah will stop. The adab and the akhlaq they display it's not the Islamic Adam and Akhlaq, some of our brothers. And also part of this advice is to teach them what is good. And from those people that we give advice from the generality of the Muslims is ourselves and our families first. That's the starting point ourselves and our families first. The subject of this hadith is to clarify the levels of sincere advice and nasiha and its rulings.
a comprehensive explanation of this hadith. Allah, in this hadith, brothers and sisters, we find the importance of enjoining each other to the truth as well as enjoining each other to patience. patience. As we can see from the hadith, from the ayah, the, the, the surah al-asr, wal asr by the time. Indeed, all of mankind is at a loss, except for those who believe and do righteous actions, and watawasul bil haqi, that they enjoy each other to the truth, and they enjoy each other to patience. And so we see in this hadith, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet told us about a nasiha. And this word, this term nasiha, is a comprehensive term. Comprehensive term. Which enjoins upon the Muslims to be sincere in their advice to each other particularly to the Book of Allah, to Allah, sorry, then the Book of Allah, then His Messenger, then the, the rulers of the Muslims, and the laity of the Muslims. The fiqh of the hadith. From the fiqh of the hadith, brothers and sisters, we find That this hadith points out the importance of sincere advice. The importance of sincere advice. And as a side point, especially in our day and age, a brother or sister may be going off the rails, doing something incorrect. We should advise that person, not as the trend of some people, not to advise and put out a, a, a recording on YouTube about that person and what they're doing. But advise people. We also learn from this hadith that there are five important things in respect to advice and nasiha. And they are advice to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims and the generality of the Muslims. The third thing we find, brothers and sisters, in terms of fiqh of this hadith, is the encouragement to give sincere advice to each other, particularly in respect to these five things, that is to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims, and the generality of the Muslims. And this is an important aspect in respect to protecting one's deen. To protecting one's deen, protecting the religion is very important. Because if we don't advise each other, how do we know we're making mistakes? Isn't it? If I don't advise the brothers, the brothers don't advise me, I may do something I think is from Islam, not from Islam. But when we advise each other, open the channels to advice, we preserve the religion. The fourth thing we learned from this, brothers and sisters, the prohibition of ghish, deception and cheating. Why? Because if sincere advice is from the religion, then it's opposite cheating and deception. Is that from the religion? The fifth thing we learn from this hadith, brothers and sisters, is that advice is from two angles. The first, those things that are obligatory, and the second are those things which are not obligatory. So, some advice, if you see somebody committing shit, what are you going to do? Advise them, isn't it? Yes. You advise them. If you see, for example, somebody wearing a t-shirt with obscure, obscure language which is not clear what it is, 
Then you may advise him if you understand, but you may not advise him if you don't understand, isn't it? So there's some things that are obligatory to, for us to advise. And this is sometimes in this country we get messed up. The obligatory stuff we leave off. The stuff is not obligatory, we go full force into it. The sixth thing is that from the conditions of Nasiha, it is not an obligation that the person must accept what you say. You give the Nasiha and you leave it. The seventh thing is, from the greatest, great categories of advice, is to give advice to the person who seeks your, your advice in a religious affair. So the person comes to you asking you about the religion is from the greatest of the categories of Nasiha. And last of all, that the Muslim should give advice to both the Muslim and the non-Muslim in that which is khair, which that which is good. And this is relevant to our situation. Because sometimes we have people at work who have toxic lifestyles. And some of us, our mentality is, who cares? Leave them. Am I right? Any <clears throat> Guys or girls drinking too much. Who cares, man? Chuck. Leave them, am I right? No, give them advice. Give them advice. With that being said, brothers and sisters, we go to the eighth hadith. Bismillah. The eighth hadith. On the authority of Ibn Umar, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was ordered to combat people until they testify that there is no deity worth of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah until they establish the Salat and give the Zakat. Then if they do that, they will save God from me, their blood and wealth except for what occurs by the right of Islam and their reckoning is with Allah the Most High, reported by Bukhari and Muslim. al hadith al thamin and Abi Umar radiallahu anhuma أن الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد محمد أن محمد رسول الله ويقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة فإذا فعلوا ذلك أصم مني دماؤهم وأموالهم إلا بحق الإسلام وحسابهم على الله تعالى رواه بخاري ومسلم. First of all, brothers and sisters, that this hadith has been in terms of the sources of this hadith. Where the hadith comes from? It comes from uh, Imam Bukhari, the, the hadith collection of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. In respect to the narrator of this hadith, then he is Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu and the week before we gave a comprehensive biography of him. In this hadith, brothers and sisters, the subject of this hadith is the dawah to Tawheed and its importance. A comprehensive explanation of this hadith that, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for one important purpose. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَإِنْسْ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِي That I've created the jinn and mankind except to worship me. However, brothers and sisters, shaitan has made us move away from the worship of Allah towards the worship of idols, statues, stones, and today, ideology. Atheism is an ideology. And so people have fallen short and people are falling into disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as in the case of in the case of atheism and they have fallen into associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala committing shirk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to establish the proof and evidence of the people by his messengership. 
And so he has been ordered to call the people to Tawheed. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ And indeed we have sent to every nation a messenger that they worship Allah and they stay away from الطاغوت that which make, uh, causes a barrier between Allah and his worshipper. However, as the Prophet ﷺ is the seed of all the Prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered him with that which he ordered the messengers that came before him and that is the da'wah to Tawheed. And from this brothers and sisters is a jihad. A jihad is of two types. The defensive jihad and the offensive jihad. An important point here brothers and sisters, as a side point, that jihad is an act of worship. Jihad is an act of worship. Every single act of worship has conditions. Or you just do it as you feel like. Has conditions. And same with jihad. So the offensive jihad has conditions and has to be contextualized with the other hadith of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because there are places where the Prophet didn't attack. There was no offensive jihad. And even the spread of Islam for our African Asia wasn't just by offensive jihad. It spread through India, how? Through Dawa. Africa, how did it spread through Africa? Through the sword? No, through Dawa. How did it spread through Asia? Through Dawa. So this has to be taken in the context. So this hadith is about the offensive jihad but has been taken into the context of all the other ahadith that get tell us about the conditions of jihad. So, from the conditions of the offensive jihad is imam, to have a leader. What we find now today is individuals, small groups of people will say, well, I'm fighting jihad. How are you fighting jihad? With no command from the imam. Also, they will say we are from the Islamic State and they sent us to fight jihad. There are conditions for this jihad. If you enter into the United Kingdom, for example, with a, a visa, the visa is the same as having a treaty with another entity. You are saying, yes, I'm coming in and obeying your rules. One of the rules of the, the, the visa is that you don't cause havoc or commit crimes. You don't do acts of terror. That's something. That's a binding contract between you and the British state. So how can you now enter with a visa, agreeing, affirming that you follow those conditions and then start terror attacks? It's impossible. Another important thing, as a side issue from this hadith, the Prophet said to fight the people in order to do what? La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Am I right? Yes. Is Islam then, brothers and sisters, as we see with the un-Islamic state, our type of Islam, you take it on board. If you don't, even if you're Muslim, we'll kill you. Is that expressed in this hadith? Have you ever heard from anybody affiliated with the Islamic state, La ilaha illallah? Have you ever heard them talk about La ilaha illallah in these conditions? Have you? Have you ever seen them? In their literature, go through what are the conditions of La ilaha illallah? So they go totally against this hadith. On top of this, La ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah has conditions. From those conditions is the person affirms that there's no deity worthy worship but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, yes or no? Then how can people like the Islamic State, which are run by people who from the Ba'ath Party, the Arab Nationalist Party, who don't agree with La ilaha illallah, for them, as they say in their their slogan, the, the Ba'ath Party, there's nothing comparable to it. Doesn't that negate La ilaha illallah by itself? The party, there's nothing comparable to it. Doesn't that negate it? Negates it. So we have to be careful. So from the fiqh of this hadith, brothers and sisters, is that the offensive jihad is in brackets you should write, with its conditions and pillars. Yes? 
Because there's no offensive jihad for somebody coming into the UK or someone in the UK. There's no offensive jihad. You're here. So, the offensive jihad, brothers and sisters, is purpose and its aim is to establish that none has the right to be worshipped in truth but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. That's what it's about. Anything and everything else, out the window. And that's the thing. So you see people go with the Islamic state wide, quote unquote, 70 virgins in paradise. Is that what you find jihad? For 70 virgins in paradise? A stuff for they make out as if paradise is a brothel. You, you go to paradise, a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you fight jihad when you fight jihad for la ilaha illah. That's why you fight jihad, not for the 70 virgins. You imagine the guy on the battlefront, all he's thinking in his mind is 70 virgins. That's all he's on his mind. He's got a one track mind, that's what he has. It's a one track mind. Especially these guys over here. You get me? So you can imagine what's in his mind. Oh, the Bilam and the Shaitan al Rajim. Yeah? And you die, and you just want them 70 virgins. That's not jihad. The gender, the paradise is not a brothel. And jihad is to establish the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making it the most high. Also from the fiqh of this hadith, brothers and sisters, is that if somebody declares their entry into Islam, then their wealth and their honor is prohibited. Their wealth and their honor is prohibited. The third thing we learn from this hadith, brothers and sisters, is that the foundations of jihad is to establish Allah's word, making it the most high. Establish Allah's word, making it the most high. And in brackets you would say, this is for the offensive jihad. The offensive jihad. Also we see from this hadith, brothers and sisters, the high, st the lofty status of the kalima. The lofty status of the kalima. The shahada, and la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah. There's something to be fought for. The lofty status of it. And last of all we find from this hadith is the affirming of the reckoning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold every single person to account for what they have done in this dunya. Wallahu a'lam. Let's go to hadith, the ninth hadith please. Barakallahu. The ninth hadith on the authority of Abu Huraira, Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhir, radiallahu anhu, who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Whatever I have prohibited you from, then avoid it. And whatever I have ordered you to do, then fulfill it as much as you are able. Indeed, what destroyed those before you was the abundant questioning and disputes with their prophets, reported by Bukhari and Muslim. Hadith al Tasir. And Abi Huraira, and Abi Huraira, Abdullah, Abdur, and Abi Huraira, Abdur Rahman ibn Sakhr, Radilahu anhu qal, Samatu Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaku, Ma na heitukum anhu fajtanibuhu, Wama amartukum bihi fatu minhu mastatatum. فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ رَوَاهُ بُخَارِي وَمُسْلِمْ So this hadith has been narrated by Abdul Rahman by Abu Huraira, Abdul Rahman ibn al-Sakhr The source of this hadith is Bukhari and Muslim as for the narrator of the narrator of this hadith, then he is 
Abdullah o Abdurrahman Ibn Sakhar Al-Dawsi Al-Azadi Al-Yamani known as Abu Hurairah the venerable companion and he accepted Islam in the year of Khaybar and he was a witness to it with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then he was a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the word is lazim and the word lazim means to stay close to somebody to, to be a companion of the person to follow them wherever they go and he did this until he became a hafiz a hafiz according to the ulama of hadith is somebody who knows more hadith than they don't know that is they have such a, a vast comprehensive knowledge or memorization of hadith there's very few hadith they don't know so you give him a hadith bam he knows it yeah so he's known to be one of the hufal the memorizers of the sahaba and one of the great narrators of the hadith of the Prophet because he doesn't the Rasul, he was with the Rasul وسلم, watching him, being with him when things happened, battles took place and he memorized them and he died in the year 59 after the hijrah, the hijrah of the Prophet The subject of this hadith, brothers and sisters, is the obligation of the legis the responsibility from the legislation in respect to actions being an order or to abandon something which is prohibited or warned against. And so from the comprehensive understanding of the hadith that the sharia, the legislation has placed a responsibility upon the Muslim to either comply to follow that which you've been ordered or to stay away from that or not to do that which you've been prohibited from doing. From the fiqh of this hadith, brothers and sisters, is as follows. One, the order to stay away from those things that have not transpired or fallen. Fearing that it would be revealed and made obligatory and of course this is the time of the Prophet Wasallam. So also you learn from this hadith the second thing, thing is that lots of questioning may open the doors of doubt to the person. Similarly, lots of disagreement may result in the person being destroyed. And this is important, especially in our day and age, where people love to ask questions about many things that haven't transpired. What if this? What if that? What if this? What if that? Ahl al-Sunnah wa al-Jama'ah to ask questions to the people of knowledge about things that have transpired, that have happened. And that also concerns you. Many times I have to ask about things. If you've got a million pounds and you give a quarter of it in charity, well, you're broke, no joke. Right? What are you asking the question for? Ask about that £2.50 that you have. Yes? And I'm being gracious here. People ask loads of questions. You have to be careful because questions may lead to shubahat. Why does it lead to Shubahat? I know a young brother 
who went onto the internet. And going onto the internet, he went to websites of people who were trying to quote unquote refute Islam. And he came to us saying, look, I want you to convince me Islam is the truth. If you can put away all these doubts I have, I'll stay in Islam. Otherwise, I've left. So it really happened to me. I said to him, Akhi Aziz, Allah doesn't need me, doesn't need you. Don't think somehow you're needed. I'm not saying this to denigrate you or put you down, but you need Allah, Allah doesn't need you. But I said, also, look, you have to be careful. Because he, he brought some points. And I said, okay, this thing about the Prophet وسلم, what's the source of it? Where? Went to where? Wikipedia. SubhanAllah. Is that your source? Wikipedia. You don't know who wrote it, didn't write it. They went, I said, okay, where did they get that doubt from? When you look for the reference point for the doubt, it's by some Orientalist. Some Orientalist who himself wrote about Islam in order to persuade people not to stay in Islam. What was the job of the Orientalists? They denigrate Islam. Like those people are Africanists. In the, in the 60s and 70s and 50s and 40s, when people wrote about Tanzania, what would they say? Tanzania, beautiful country for the savages. Is it? Why would they say that? They want people to look at Tanzania with respect, honor, dignity, no? Because in the 60s and the 50s, you were under British colonialism, isn't it? And Tanzania was a British colony, they want to maintain that colony. So when he talked about Africa, for example, ancient Egypt. Where did the ancient Egyptians come from? There was a theory that the ancient Egyptians originally come from Europe, they worked their way down into Africa, and they set up the ancient Egyptian civilization. Do you know that? Why is that? Because of supremacy. How can Africans, how can Africans make a civilization that African people are savages? This is what they believe, isn't it? But the reality on the ground, brothers and sisters, is that Africa, Egypt, Egypt, ancient Egypt, is African. From the southern part of Africa, that's where the Egypt, ancient Egyptians said they came from. They didn't come from the northern part, that is towards Europe or whatever. They came from the southern part, near Rhodesia, that's where they claimed they came from. Interesting, isn't it? So what happens, brothers and sisters, that all this questioning makes you fall into doubt. And all this ikhtilafat, that you have, may lead you to be destroyed. Look at today, we, we know brothers who are always ikhtilaf over small things. What happens? This one doesn't speak to that one. That one doesn't speak to this one. What happens? From being a big group, it starts to become small. Until, as you see with the takfiris, they've said, everyone is a kafir. And I remember once I heard a sheikh, he said, one guy was asked, who are the Muslims in the world? He said, me. My wife, and I heard there's one guy in India. You hear me? That's what he said. Me, my wife, and one guy from India. That's the Muslims. Yes? This is also, sorry to mention, the belief of Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid Qutb in milestones, what does he call the Masajid? He calls them Ma'bud. Places of worship, temples. Al Ashmawi he said that one of the young in the time of Saint Qutb back in the 50s or 60s, 60s it was yeah, he said to him that one of the guys who were close to Saint Qutb, he said, look, we don't eat the meat of the Muslims. Why don't they eat the meat, the meat, the meat of the Muslims? Why don't they eat the meat of the Muslims? Because they're kuffar. So Saint Qutb said to him. But we see the meat of the Muslims like the meat of Al Kitab. Same ruling as Al Kitab, the same meat of the Muslims. You have uh, Al Maqdasi. What did he say? He said the whole Muslim world has fallen into kufr. He said, I don't make exception for Makkah and Medina, including Makkah and Medina. Do you see that? 
So when you get into these ikhtilafat, where do you end up? Like these people there. Also, we learn from this hadith, brothers and sisters. The obligation of abandoning, staying away from everything our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam has prohibited. We learn also, brothers and sisters, that what the Prophet has commanded us, then it is obligatory upon us. Once we have, of course, side issue, fulfilled the conditions and fulfilled the pillars of that thing, and we're, we're able to do it. Another thing that we find from this hadith, is the, the obligation of the Muslim to search and research those things that the Prophet ﷺ came with. That is, we learn the religion of Islam. Many people are content just be living their lives as they are. But now you've got to seek knowledge to learn what Allah has commanded you to do and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to stay away from. What the Prophet commanded you to do and what the Prophet told you to stay away from. How are you going to know? If you don't know the deen of Islam, how are you going to know what to do, what not to do? When Ramadan comes, you're not going to know when to break your fast, when to start your fast, when, what, what are the, you know, who are the people who are absolved from fasting, who are the people who should give the fidya. If you don't research these things, how will you know? And mashallah, we live in a time where Islamic knowledge is everywhere. And we can read, we can write most of us, alhamdulillah. So the person should seek, look, relearn the religion to know what is obligatory upon us. Also, that, that Islam is a religion of simplicity. And it has not made obligatory upon the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything except they're able to do it and it doesn't make obligatory upon them those things which they can't take meaning that the religion of Islam is a very simple religion it's not a hard religion you don't have to go into a mountain for 40 days with only a pot of food and semi-naked. It's very, very simple. Everything, once you meet the conditions, once you meet the 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 the, 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 arkan, the, the pillars of it, you do it. If you don't meet the conditions, that's something else. So in the month of Ramadan, is it obligatory for babies to fast? No. But if you reach the age of puberty, it's a obligatory point you to fast. Is fasting itself difficult? Is it difficult? Brothers, what do you think? No. So Allah hasn't legislated something for us that is beyond our capability. So you don't have to, for example, build a rocket machine and go into space for 10 seconds and come back. Sounds crazy, isn't it? Yes. But you may have some religions that place things on people which, you know, a human being can't do for a sustained period of time anyhow. But Islam is not like that. Very easy itself, very simple, as well as if you don't meet the conditions, then something else. Wallahu Allah. Let's move on now, inshallah ta'ala to... Should we move on to the next one or should we stop it? Stop, yeah? Jazakum wa khair, barakum wa fikum, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. So next week we go on to the 10th hadith. If there are any clarifications or corrections, we open the floor. If not, then jazakum wa he mentions uh, the Prophet sorry, so he mentions um, Hajj before the fasting. Uh -huh. Is there a reason for this? 
If there's a reason, can I research that and come back to you? That's a very good question. Wonderful, thank you. Send me SMS to remind me, please, yeah? When is that talking? You said something, I don't. You say with Mujahi, with Mujahi, yeah, the people who kill Usman, something like that. Who are these people? I said the Khawari. Oh, the Khawari, who are they? Are they Muslim or not? The Prophet said in the hadith of the coming of those people who will come into the deen and come out like an arrow. And the ulama have named them the Khawarij. And they are those extremists who declare Muslims to be non Muslims because of falling into major sins. Yeah? So I've got two questions. The Sheikh, the Taqdeem of Hajj. The, the Taqdeem of Hajj on.